Amen. If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to the book of Revelation. We appreciate all of our uh, worship team, song leader. We appreciate uh, all those who labor to make the service work. Our security team, police officers that are here this morning, keeping us all safe so we can worship God in peace. We appreciate all of their labors and efforts. Uh, let me just preface this sermon by saying, uh, let's keep movement to a minimum. This is a message that I want everyone to hear every sentence, every word, every syllable, every letter to this message because I believe it's going to help you. It'll change your life, and I believe it's going to add something to us and will never be the same. I want to know what heaven is going to be like. I woke up with that thought the other day. I want to know, can we know what heaven is going to be like? 73% of people believe in heaven. A lot of people that are going to hell believe in heaven. 62% of people believe in hell. Heaven is our subject this morning. I want to know, and I want you to know this morning, and I think you will know a little bit more about what it's going to be like to experience heaven. That's what I'm after this morning. Not the streets of gold or the mansions, although I'm going to mention that, but there's an experience of heaven that I want to try to communicate to you this morning. What is heaven going to be like? I want to know. And I want you to want to know this morning. So what about that? The Bible talks so much about heaven. It describes its physical attributes. Uh, that's what Revelation 21 and 22 is all about. We all know here and believe in heaven, at least most people do, as that statistic indicates, but probably much larger than that in this audience here this morning. We believe in life after death, that this life is not all there is. We're going to spend eternity somewhere in some fashion. And without the description that the Bible gives us, it is guesswork. People don't know. They hope for something better, but they don't know. Heaven is for those who qualify for heaven. Hell is for those who don't. There's a reward for the righteous if you can manage to navigate your way through this life, uh, having given your life to Christ uh, and then continuing to serve God, God grow uh, and accelerate your Christian faith, uh, then heaven is for you. It's a reward uh, for the righteous uh, and retribution for the sinner is what hell is all about. We live in a moral universe that flows from the character of God. Even in our world, in some extreme cases, uh, bad people have to be isolated from good people. That's called prison or home confinement. I want to know what heaven is going to be like. Can I know? Can I know more than there's mansions and streets of gold? Will it benefit me to know? Should I even delve into this? Should I have gotten all excited about this when I thought about it. I want to know what heaven is going to be like. Does God want us to know? We know that it's a physical place. We know that we will have our emotions in place. There's a spiritual dimension, obviously. There are things that we can't know now about heaven. We're incapable of comprehending or grasping or understanding, that certainly has to be said and is true. There's no way for me to explain in a sermon the unknowable about heaven. 
Some of it is going to be, the vast majority of it probably is going to be things that we cannot ascertain or describe. And when I ask the question, uh, do you want to know what heaven is going to be like? I can't answer that totally and fully. That will come in due course when we get there. But what I'm concerned about this morning is what we can know, what we should know about heaven. What is heaven going to be like to experience? Can that be explained in a sermon? I think it can to some degree. I've had a lot of enjoyment since I had that thought the other morning. Thinking about it, reading my Bible, taking notes, working on this message. It's been a very worthwhile exercise for me and it's changed me. And I hope that it puts a little more in you to anticipate and to look forward and maybe most importantly become more unwilling to do anything that would risk experiencing heaven and maybe it'll put a little more in us to try to reach people and take them with us to heaven. So let's read our text. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 21, excuse me. Revelation chapter 21, beginning in verse 1. You can read the whole chapter later, and you should. I'm going to give you some homework. Read Revelation 21 and 22 after you get home. Not now, but after you get home. For now, we're going to read just the first few verses. Revelation 21. Remember, this is what God is showing the Apostle John. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. That's John talking. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with man, and he will dwell with them. They shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he... Jesus, who sat on the throne, said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And Jesus said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. And I love this last line. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Pray with me for a moment. Would you open your heart? Father, thank you for this opportunity to preach and to minister the word of God and to present revelation and truth that can redeem the lost and minister to the saints and encourage and build up and give hope to every life. And Father, we give you praise for it all. In Jesus' name. Let's get to the obvious, and I'm preaching on this part of the sermon just to say it, because it's important to say it, but I do want to move beyond it. And that is the simple fact that heaven is a place. This is what most people point to, probably you would. If somebody asked you, what is heaven like? What does the Bible say? You would begin to describe the physical attributes that you may be familiar with. What is heaven going to be like? I'm going to mention some of them this morning, but for the purpose of moving past them to the actual experience of heaven, But let's stick with the fact uh, that heaven is a place for a moment because this is not unimportant. Jesus talked uh, a lot about it. Jesus showed uh, John uh, by revelation uh, a place uh, that he identified uh, as the New Jerusalem or heaven. 
The Bible goes to great lengths to describe the physical attributes of heaven. Jesus taught his disciples, mentioned to them, heaven is a place. It has location. It has physical attributes that you're going to see. You're going to experience them through your five senses like we experience things through our five senses now. In John chapter 14, when Jesus uh, was with his disciples, uh, he said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, where he lives, the word house is used purposely by Jesus uh, to describe that God has a place where he exists. In my father's house, in his dwelling place, in his abode, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you will be also. And where I go, and the... Uh, and, and where I go, you know, and the way you know. The Amplified Translation says, uh, and to the place I go. A place has a where. That's why Jesus said, where I am, there you may be also. The word mansions there refers to a dwelling place, a residence, uh, an abode, a place where one lives, where one dwells. A place, the word place in that text uh, refers to a space that is marked off, uh, that has measurements. And we know that the New Jerusalem uh, has very distinct measurements, very, very detailed measurements. Uh, it is a space marked off. Uh, it is described as an inhabited place, uh, as in a city, a village, uh, or a district, uh, or a locality. Now, words matter very much. Jesus is trying to convey something that he wants us to know so that we can visualize it. If you were going to go on a vacation, for example, somewhere you'd never been, you would immediately get on your computer, you'd Google uh, uh, Switzerland, or you'd Google Disneyland, or Florida, or California, and you'd start looking to see what it's going to be like, to see what's coming, and that adds to the anticipation and the excitement. The text says that he is preparing that place for us right now. What is he doing now? Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. He's doing that now. What exactly is he doing? How are the preparations for our soon arrival uh, going? Are they to the stage uh, of putting on the finishes, uh, getting the final inspections done? I think they are. And when do we get to go? The book of Revelation, of course, gives us more than what Jesus said there in that text. It's a place with streets and mansions and lights. It's lit up, not by Alpine Electric, but by God himself. As I said, you can read Revelation 21. It is a created place for us to dwell in for all of eternity. In our text, Jesus sat on the throne and said, verse 5, Behold, I make all things new. Heaven is a made place, created by God for us. Further from where I read in the text in Revelation 21, 22, but I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. Jesus is there in heaven. He's going to dwell with us there. 
He is the lamb mentioned in that verse. Uh, because of his presence, uh, you'll have all the light that you need. It will permeate and resonate uh, everywhere you are and everywhere you go. You'll be aware of God's presence. It'll be seen, it'll be felt, uh, and it'll be experienced. The Bible talks about a river that's in heaven and special trees that are there. In Revelation 22, the next chapter, it says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit for every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations." All this along with what you are already familiar with. Rivers, mansions, trees, light. And then in Revelation 21, 21, the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. And there is much more. Like I said, read Revelation 21 and 22. But I want to get to my main point this morning, and that is what is heaven going to be like to actually experience? We are going to experience heaven in a way that we don't experience anything else. And in order to experience heaven, first of all, we have to be changed. We can't experience heaven in our current state or in our current condition. We can't. If you were to go into heaven now, you would blow up. We're not fit for heaven yet. We're saved. We're born again. But we are not yet ready for heaven. Something has to happen first. Because though saved, we're wearing out, we're dying, we're aging. We still have our carnal nature that manifests itself from time to time. We can still have doubts and unbelief and get angry. Can't go to heaven like that, even though we're saved. So the first order of business is to save us here on earth in this life which puts us in a position for our sins to be forgiven and then to work toward holiness, greater Christ-likeness, and ultimately the transformation that is to come. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Listen very carefully. This has to happen before we can go to heaven. Amen. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immorality, immor, immorality, immortality. <laughs> then we can enter into heaven. Can't now. That's the final brush stroke on the masterpiece that God is producing in each and every one of our lives. All that we have been struggling with, our failing health, Aging, deterioration, struggles with our flesh, all that pertains to our physical life will hinder the experience of heaven. It has to be eradicated and it is going to happen when in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, this mortal takes on immortality and we're going to be changed and transformed in such a supernatural, incredible, powerful and profound way. So now we're ready to experience heaven. What is that going to be like? The actual physical, emotional, and spiritual experience of heaven. 
We like being in special places because of the experience of it. We like being home. I love being home. I like sleeping in my own bed, getting home from a trip, but I also like going to places. You love going to Disneyland, going on a vacation, going somewhere to rest and relax. We love the experience of that. So that's what I want to try and capture with you. I want to talk about five attributes that describe what heaven will be like. And the first one that I want to point to is that you will experience eternal gratitude, an overwhelming gratitude that will always be felt, always be present, and that will never fade. We, we get a rush, and we have a good feeling when we are grateful and when we express gratitude. It is a very pleasant, it is a very enjoyable experience. Someone does something for you or buys you a special gift that you've always wanted or meets a need in your life that you couldn't meet for yourself or saves your life, does a favor for you that you didn't ask them to do, and it is thank you. I appreciate that so very much. And you have this warm, and you have this good feeling, and then it goes away. It fades away because it's temporary, because uh, there are so many other things going on in our, our life. Something's going to happen that gets us mad. Uh, we're going to get frustrated because we don't have enough money for this or that or the other thing. Uh, and so it's a momentary experience. It's a momentary expression. In heaven, that's not what our gratitude is going to be like. It's going to be an eternal gratitude uh, that is always effervescing. Uh, it is always present. Uh, it will never fade. It will never go away. Uh, it gets overwhelmed now with the problems that we have in our lives uh, and the pressures that we have in our lives. Uh, when we get to heaven, uh, you're always going to feel grateful uh, and thankful. Uh, you're always going to want to express it. Uh, there won't be any complaints. There won't be any criticism. There won't be any feeling uh, that this isn't good enough. Mostly, of course, our gratitude uh, is to God for our salvation. It's going to be just overwhelming. But also we're going to be grateful for the people that are there. Those who witnessed to us, shared their faith, those uh, who took time to sacrifice and follow up on us uh, and help establish us in the faith uh, of Jesus Christ. Uh, imagine the gratitude we're in heaven for eternity uh, because this individual told us about Jesus, prayed for us, uh, and followed up on us. It's going to be an overwhelming emotional and spiritual expression of gratitude, uh, and nothing will ever get in the way. It will never fade for all of eternity it will always be there in revelation chapter 11 uh, the bible says we give you thanks O lord god almighty uh, the one who is and the one who was and who is to come uh, because you have taken your great power uh, and have reigned in revelation 7 uh, after these things i looked uh, and behold a great multitude which had uh, uh, which no one could number which no one could number, uh, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, uh, standing before the throne uh, and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes uh, and palm branches in their hands, saying, Amen, uh, blessing and glory and wisdom, uh, thanksgiving and honor and power uh, be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Uh, and that feeling of gratitude will never fade. It will always grow, uh, and you'll be expressing it uh, and, and, and manifesting it in praise, in worship toward God in gratitude for everyone that's there. Secondly, the second experience of heaven will be that there will be no more tears. How many things do you weep over now that grieve you? Some of you are very troubled by what's going on in your life right now. There may be overwhelming sadness, overwhelming grief, frustration, sorrow, anxiety, darkness, uh, and oppression. That's part of our lives. Uh, we can't have that going on when we get to heaven. 
It'll get in the way of the experience of heaven. Uh, that's why the transformation has to occur. David cried out, I am weary with my groaning all night. I make my bed swim. I drench my couch with my tears. My eyes wastes away because of grief. In heaven, you will never, ever, ever again be vexed by anything that occurs in your life. There will be no reason to cry. No tears will be shed, at least not in that context. No sadness. No loneliness that causes depression. In verse 4 of our text, God, God will wipe away. When God wipes something away, it's wiped away. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain. For the former things have passed away. So a lot of what you experience in your life now, the time that we spent, the emotional energy uh, that we waste uh, in grief, in anger, in upset, uh, in frustration, uh, in sorrow, uh, weeping on our pillow at night, feeling like we have nowhere to go and no one to talk to, uh, that will never, ever again be felt by any one of us uh, for all of eternity. Thirdly, there will be perfect fellowship with all who are there. You will never, ever again have a reason to be angry with anyone. No one will ever offend you, hurt you, gossip about you, slander you. There will be no conflicts, no broken relationship, no disfellowshipping people who hurt us or offend us, no criticism of anyone. You will never do that again for all of eternity. Only love, only perfect bonds of fellowship, no offense, no violence, no hurt feelings, only valuing and appreciating each other. You'll never again, as I said, ever be angry with anyone ever again. That's not going to happen in heaven. There will never again be a reason to criticize anyone. Get mad. Cut someone off. How many friends have you had in life that you no longer have contact with because of an offense or because you're mad at them or they're mad at you? There's been a misunderstanding. Someone hurts you or you hurt them inadvertently or maybe purposefully. How much does all that mess occupy our lives, even as Christians? How many negative, even toxic emotions are produced because of how we think about people, because of the absence of love and forgiveness towards individuals in heaven you will not be capable of being angry with anyone at any time for all of eternity. There won't be any hint of pride, insecurity, jealousy, discrimination, competition, or vengeance. You'll never again be angry or even frustrated with someone. You won't have any, no one will ever give you a reason to be upset with them. Imagine if that could be eliminated now. You see, that's why we're not quite ready yet for heaven. That transformation has to come about first. Perfect relationship with people you knew here on earth. Won't that be wonderful? With family members and brethren and others that have gone before us. Perfect relationship with everyone you're going to meet in heaven. Revelation says... In 7, 9, I already read it, but I want to restate it. Therefore, after these things, I looked and behold a great multitude, which no one could number of nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. Anywhere in the world you go, where there's a border and two nations, there's been a war nearly every place. Tribes within nations, like Ghana or Nigeria, 
the various factions and tribes that are identified by different customs and languages uh, have been at war with each other for centuries. The Native Americans, before we ever arrived here, were in constant conflict with one another. But in heaven, uh, nations and tribes and peoples and tongues uh, are going to love one another as they stand before the throne. You won't be capable of criticizing or being angry with anyone at any time ever. Fourthly, there will be perfect fellowship with God. We will see him and be able to approach him and talk to him and sit down with him without any fear. If I knew everything that you think and everything about your life that you conceal, if I knew all of that, and you knew that I knew it, you wouldn't want to get anywhere near me. Oh, my God, he can see everything in my mind, my thoughts that I just thought he looked terrible today and he's getting too fat for his suit. <laughs> you wouldn't want to be anywhere near someone. How much sin right now, bad habits, how much of a secret life do you have right now, right now, before God? Sin is what makes us fearful to approach. You won't have any sin. You can be confident. He knows everything. And I'm going to run right into his arms because I don't care. Because what is in me is good because Jesus is in me. And God is good and he's taken away my sin and my flesh and my carnality. His eyes will look right through you. He will know everything about you. And you will know he will know everything about you. But you won't be afraid. You won't be embarrassed. You won't need to repent of anything. Nothing to hide. No secrets. Nothing to feel guilt over. It will be perfect relationship with God. 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now are we the children of God, and, is not, and, it is, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. We shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. What does that mean? Well, all I can say is how we see him now is not how we will see him then when we get to heaven. We're going to see him in a totally different way. That's what he means. We will see him as he is. We're not seeing him as he is. We're here on earth living in a finite world. We have the flesh. We have carnality. Uh, uh, and, and, and he's in our hearts. Uh, and we have relationship with him. We can pray. We can cry out. But there's something evidently missing uh, that we cannot be exposed to uh, unless that transformation from mortal to immortality takes place that I described. Then he can expose uh, the full manifestation of who he is. We'll see him as he is. That's coming. 1 John 3, 2 in the Amplified says, Beloved, we are even here and now children of God, and it is not yet made clear what we will be after his coming. So there are things that we can't know. Not clear yet. But we know that when he comes and is revealed, we will as his children be like him because we will see him just as he is in all of his glory. We don't get to see that now. But we will for all of eternity. And fifthly, you may think this is a little odd, but we will have the very best job, the most satisfying work ever. What? I thought heaven was going to be an eternal nap. Eternal vacation, eternal leisure. Nope. If you don't want to work, you might have to go to hell. <laughs> but if you're going to go to heaven, the Bible says there's occupation. Work was part of God's creation before sin from the very beginning. In the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 1, verse 27, so God created man in his own image. 
In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Adam had work to do. He had a job to fulfill. He had a purpose that God gave him. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion. He was to be occupied with extending the Garden of Eden throughout the entire earth. So what is our occupation in heaven? The Bible gives us an indication. We can't know everything about it, for sure. But we have two very important words that are used here. Number one is Revelation 22, 3, and there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. That's what we're going to do. We're going to serve. If you can't serve here and now, if it bothers you, if you're so inconvenienced and so rubbed wrong when you're asked to do something here, you might not quite fit in because our whole life is going to be about serving the King of Kings and the Lord of Glory, and you're going to feel so privileged at being able to do that. It's going to be the most fulfilling work you've ever done. It'll feel better than working and making all kinds of money and having all kinds of nice things. It'll go way beyond that because we're serving the God of Glory. The word means to perform sacred services for a king. Revelation 22, 5, there shall be no more night there. They need no lamp for light of the sun, nor the light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign. We're going to serve, and we're going to reign. The word reign means to govern. It means to exercise kingly authority. Remember in the parable uh, of the talents, uh, uh, he gave to the one with uh, two talents, uh, two cities to rule. The one with five, ten, or four cities, and the one with five, ten cities to rule. There's going to be the expression of authority in heaven by the saints under the King of Kings and the Lord of Glory to govern, to exercise kingly authority, to exercise, to, to exercise the highest level of influence. So there is going to be an occupation for all of eternity. And sixthly, this is my final one, there's the anticipation of the unknown. We have that now because what I'm trying to describe. The glory of heaven, our knowledge of God, the experience of heaven is going to be unfolding for all of eternity. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, but as it is written, eye has not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. I believe that it can have an earthly expression, and it does, uh, but I much more look at that uh, as a heavenly manifestation and a heavenly expression. A lot of people live in fear about the future. You're insecure, you're uncertain. My husband's going to leave me. He's going to die. My children are going to backslide. I'm not going to have enough money. I'm going to get sick. A lot of people, a lot of Christians have a lot of fear and foreboding about the future. Look what COVID did. We are all going to die. My children are going to die. We're going to suffer loss. We're going to end up bankrupt. We're all going to be crowded under a bridge somewhere here in El Paso. Listen to this. In heaven, you will never again anticipate anything bad happening ever again. Only good. You will have no reason, there won't be any inclination to have any fear or insecurity about what's going to become of our life. A lot of my counseling is about that. Pastor, I'm just uncertain about my future. What's going to become of me and my family? Am I ever going to get married? Am I ever going to have children? Am I ever going to get healed? We have all kinds of anxiety about our future that is going to be eliminated for all of eternity, uh, there will be an overwhelming anticipation uh, about what's next and what's coming because it's all going to be good unto great unto better. So what does all this do for us? Well, as I said in the introduction, if nothing else, I have thoroughly enjoyed this sermon and the subject of it. Thinking about heaven Meditating on it over the last week on the things that are waiting for us there, the type of experience that we're going to have in heaven as best as I can grasp hold of it and ascertain it. It has enhanced my appreciation for God, 
for what he has planned for us, for what he has done for us in order to get us there. So what good has all this done? What good is the exercise of us being a little bit more familiar with the exercise of heaven? Number one, don't do anything that will jeopardize you getting there. Quit the foolishness and the sin. Cut out the bad attitudes. We can get pretty careless about how we live for God, about how we live our lives, how we behave in our homes and on our businesses and with our money. We can get very careless because we seem to get away with it. Nothing bad happens. We're not turned into a grease spot by a bolt of lightning. There's no immediate judgment. And so we live very carelessly. Too much about ourselves and not enough about Jesus. Too many excuses and not enough repentance. We need to polish, as it were, like you would polish a, a worn out pair of shoes and make them look new. A lot of our spiritual shoes have gotten tarnished and worn out and scruffed up and they need a good polishing and that can happen at this altar this morning. We need to polish our walk with God. Number two... What good does all this do? Let's help each other get to heaven. Let's help each other become as thoroughly right with God as we can be in anticipation of that great day. You know, people can help make you better if you let them. Don't reject correction. Quit being so defensive. Quit running around with hurt feelings because someone sees fit to, to try to help you and minister to you and make you better. That's what it's all about. I'm not talking about running around and criticizing. I'm talking about trying to help each other be better. You can criticize someone with love in hopes of making their lives better, and that's the right motive. Don't reject correction. Seek advice. Don't let your pride get in the way. Proverbs says, as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. And what if, what if, what if, what if you could be responsible for getting someone who's on their way to hell, getting them to heaven? It's your job to get people saved. Your job. It's your job to get people to heaven. To prevent them from going to hell. We are to plunder hell in order to populate heaven. With so much at stake, beloved. Heaven and hell are at stake. We have the answer. How can we be so distracted? Make so many excuses why we can't witness, be on outreach. Help project the testimony of, of Jesus Christ through our church and through our ministries. How can we be so self-focused from the task? God's going to want to know why. We're going to have to give accountable. What could you possibly have been so into in your life as a believer that outreach and evangelism and sharing your faith was ignored? Heaven and hell, beloved, should be part of our witness. People listen. If you just walk up to a stranger, you got a flyer in your hand. Hey, I wanted to just invite you to come out to church this coming Sunday. And they'll make a comment and you can say, you know what, do you believe in heaven and hell? Well, I don't know. You know, they'll say something that more than likely will give you opportunity to share with them a good, powerful witness. Because it relates to people. People fear death. People fear hell. People fear judgment. And hell will be the opposite of everything I just preached on that heaven is going to be. Never, ever, ever, ever in hell will you feel thankful or grateful. You can't possibly. It isn't going to happen. Imagine a life without gratitude for anything for eternity. Always and perpetual grief, sorrow, pain, and regret that will never lift. Feelings of bitterness and anger 
and hatred that will be perpetual, that will eat away at you for all of eternity. No ability to love and worship God. No ability to cry out to him and pray and know him. No ability to feel the warmth of his presence and his embrace. Because he isn't there, you can't know him, you won't know him. You'll be isolated from him. Nothing meaningful. Nothing satisfied. You're not going to be serving a king like we are. You're not going to be reigning under the authority of that king like we will be in heaven. Nothing meaningful, nothing satisfying, only emptiness. And you will only and forever and for all of eternity have fear and foreboding for the future. You'll be torn apart internally by the anticipation of what's going to come. And that will never lift. You'll never, ever, ever again be able to look forward to anything good happening. And that is never going to go away. Heaven, however, is for everyone. This is our hope. God's best is for you. But I've been such a sinner or I've backslidden. I've done so much damage. I've hurt. Heaven's for you. The cross was for the thief that was crucified next to Jesus uh, who began by blaspheming him. uh, But at the end, uh, he repented, confessed him as Lord. Heaven is for the thief. Uh, Heaven is for you. It's being made for you. Right now, Jesus is preparing a place for us to go to where all that I described and so much more that I don't even know. All I can do now is try so very hard to make real to you what the experience of heaven is going to be like in a very small way. I love the last two verses of our text, and I finish with them. And Jesus said to me, it is done. Graduation has occurred, mission accomplished, victory achieved, you're here. It is done. I am Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of life, of the fountain of the water of life, freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. This last line is worthy of an entire sermon. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his and her God, and he shall be my son, my daughter. That is what is waiting for us in heaven. I want you to bow your heads with me this morning. Amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Nobody moving around. We're going to get to our baptism shortly. This is such a sacred moment. We're standing on such holy ground. We have an altar that we can come to. Oh, God, thank you a thousand times over. Thank you for all that is waiting for me. Now I'm saved and I'm grateful for my salvation and my relationship with you, but I suffer pain, I have grief, I get angry, I'm not complete yet, I know I'm not like you, like I'm going to be one day when you supernaturally change me. Oh God, I need you to confirm and to cement in my spirit a a vision for what is to come. Help me, oh God. In Jesus' name, as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, nobody's moving around for a moment. Perhaps you've come to church this morning, you're not right with God, you're not saved, you haven't been born again. And if I could put it so very bluntly, you're on your way to hell. Your body's dying, you're not going to live forever. Your spirit's dying. You're not getting better. It's not less hatred, less pride, it's more. And all those things accelerate unto our physical and our spiritual death. The only answer is Jesus. Oh, beloved, if I could make it more real to you, I would. People pass from this life never having received Jesus. And then there's no opportunity to repent and get your heart right with God. God has given you an incredible gift. 
an incomprehensible opportunity today to receive Christ as your Savior, to be forgiven of your sins, to repent and tell God you're sorry and align yourself with his love and then serve him and work toward that day that's coming when we're going to be changed from mortal to immortal and we're going to see God as he is. It's all, oh, beloved, it's beyond comprehension. I want you to know what heaven is going to be like. Perhaps you're here and you need to repent, get your heart right with God. I want you to just let me pray for you, if you would, please. There's so much at stake. This is not a joke. We're not just trying to increase church membership. We're trying to get people saved. We're trying to reach people that are on their way to hell. You don't want to go there. I've had people tell me, oh, I want to go to hell so I can party and be with my friends. No, 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 no. Pastor, I'm ready to repent. I know there's sin in my life, and I'm tired of living the way I've been living. I don't want to be this person anymore. I do want to get my heart right with God, and I'm ready to receive Christ. If that describes you, I want you to do something for me right now. I want you just to lift your hand. Pastor, pray for me. God bless you, son. I see that hand. Is there anyone else? Pastor Stevens, pray for me. I want to get right with God. I'm ready today. I want to repent of my sin and give my life to Jesus. Lift your hand right up. Join this one right now. Oh, yes, Lord. I don't want to risk going to hell. I don't want to live another moment without Jesus, without love, without forgiveness. Lift your hand right now in Jesus' name. Have the courage to say, yes, that's me. I'm ready to repent and get my heart right with God. In Jesus' name, lift your hand right up and put it right back down all over this building in Jesus' name. Maybe you're backslidden. Can I appeal to the backslider this morning? What are you doing? What are you thinking? You've allowed upset, frustration to drive you away from Jesus, back into your sin. Do you realize what you're doing, what you're setting in motion? Do you realize what is at stake? Heaven and hell? Don't you want to go to heaven? Isn't it worth repenting of your sin, humbling yourself, say, God, I've been wrong. I should never have left. I should never have backslidden. I want to repent and get right. Backslider, lift your hand right now. Don't leave this building not right with God. In the name of Jesus, lift your hand right up and put it right back down. God bless you. I see that hand. Thank you. God love you. Amen. Thank you very much. You know, every once in a while, Ernie and I were talking the other day. We talked to someone in our church who's been coming for years. And they make the most unusual confession. They've been coming to church for years. I've had this happen to me. He was telling me about this recently. And they say, Pastor... I don't think I've ever gotten saved, and I don't think I've ever had a relationship with Christ. I come because it feels good. I was raised in the church. I, I enjoy the atmosphere, but I don't have a relationship with God. And I mentioned to Ernie, maybe we should preach a sermon. I don't know how many of you are out there like that, but if there's one now or more, why don't you lift your hand and make this the day of your conversion? Pastor, pray for me. Lift your hand up. I want to repent. I'm ready to get my heart right with God in the name of Jesus. If you lifted your hand, would you look at me? Did you mean that? I believe you did, sis. God love you. God bless you. Over here on my right, my brother, you raise your hand. Would you come? Ernie's right there. He's going to help you. Yoli, you bring her. Pray a sinner's prayer with them. If there's anyone else this morning that's not right with God, please get right. I haven't just preached something that is out of the Reader's Digest or out of a magazine. This is God's word. I believe this is what he wants us to know. And as Christians, doesn't it help? It did me. I hope it does you. To reinforce my faith, increase my anticipation of what is to come. And you know what else we should try to do? Listen to this. We should try to pull a little of what's going to be in heaven down here. 
better relationships, less criticism, more love and forgiveness, less pride, more repentance. Jesus said, you'll know them. They will know you're my disciples because you love one another. That's getting a little bit of heaven here on earth in people's relationships. I want to know what heaven is going to be like. And I hope this has helped you. I think we should stand, come to this altar, and just say a great big, oh God, thank you. He's at work right now preparing heaven. Not quite finished apparently because we're not there yet, but perhaps the finishing touches. The final craftsmen who are angels are working on the finishes of heaven. Oh, and what a day that's going to be when we walk those streets of gold, but more than walking the streets of gold and getting the keys to our mansion, it's going to be the experience of heaven, perpetual gratitude, no grief or fear, perfect love. No one will ever make you angry again. You'll never be upset about what someone says or does. Perfect relationship with God. You'll never be ashamed or embarrassed about what he sees in you. You've got attitudes you should be embarrassed about because he does see them. You say things and do things in isolation that you should be ashamed of. But you're not because no one else sees and you think somehow maybe God just ignores or he listens to your excuses. But then he's going to look right through you and you're not going to care because it's all good, it's all pure, it's all perfect, it's all holy, it's all righteous. Oh, God, let's cry out to him. Father, thank you. Thank you a thousand times. Thank you for all of eternity. Thank you. Oh, God, I glorify you. I praise you. I love you. I need you. I exalt you. I glorify you. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you are, for all that you have done, for all that you have accomplished in our lives. Oh, God, even further cleanse and purify our hearts as we march toward that great day when you're going to change this mortal into immortality and this temporal is going to be transformed into our eternal self. Oh, Rabba Shanda, Rabba Rasa, La Ramandere, Ala Ravilara. Why don't we forgive right now? Why don't we let go of our anger right now? Why don't we allow God to deliver us from our fears and our insecurities right now? Why don't we try to rise to a greater level of heaven in our lives and bring it here on earth in our families and in our relationships? Let's try to achieve better relationships with one another, with God more gratitude, more thanksgiving. In anticipation of preaching this sermon in prayer at 9 o'clock when we gather together here in the sanctuary, I couldn't stop thanking God and praising Him and glorifying Him and being appreciative and grateful for all that He is and all that He's done. Yeah, life may be a mess now. We may have so many hardships and struggles and difficulties. But those are temporary. Don't make them permanent. Don't act like they're permanent. What a powerful statement in our text. God shall wipe away. When God does it, it's done. When God does it, it's permanent. No more tears. No more grief. No more frustration. Never, ever, ever. Will we have those feelings and that kind of emotional expression? And perhaps you recognize there's a little bit too much of that now, and I'm going to deal with it at this altar. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, God, I thank you, I praise you, I love you, I exalt you. What, what song? The perfect.
perfect song for us to sing in worship and gratitude is what we're going to do right now. Let's all stand as we're gathered around the altar. One day we're going to gather around the throne of God just like this, only you won't see me, you'll see Jesus. Let's sing it to him. Yes, till he comes, I can almost hear the trumpet sound, and in the twinkling of an eye, I will be gone, I can't wait to hear the words, well done, yes, Lord, thank you, Jesus. again worshiping the Lord and I will wait on the Lord till and he is coming hallelujah I can almost hear the trumpet sound in a twinkling of an eye that day well done good and faithful servant yes Lord thank you Jesus done enter in thank you Lord done this is heaven I can't wait to hear Let's thank God this morning. Hallelujah. Oh, God, we give you praise. We glorify you. We worship you. We rejoice, O oh God. Andara la ravila raba shori olorobo raba la ramande. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Let's just wait on God for a moment. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, God is good. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Oh, God, you're worthy to be praised. You're worthy to be glorified. You're worthy to be exalted. Your name is above every name. Oh, God, open the windows of heaven. Send fire from heaven on these altars, O oh God. Change us forever. Thank you, thank you, Lord. Amen. God is good. Amen. Our heads are bowed. You take heaven from this sanctuary out into the highways and the byways, the workplace. Tell people about Jesus. Amen. Let's bow our heads. We're going to dismiss in prayer. Don't miss service tonight. Prayer at 530. Service at 630. Looking forward to a great time. Bring someone that needs Jesus. I believe whoever is brought 
that's not saved will get saved. That's always my faith and my confidence. So bring people that need Jesus tonight. Amen. Our heads are bowed. We're dismissing now for the water baptism. So let's go straight over there. Those that are getting baptized, I think, have already gotten themselves ready. So take place in very short order. Amen. Bowing our heads, I'm going to ask if um, Joe Russell would close us in prayer. And Father God, we thank you for your word this morning, God. Help us to live in anticipation of your soon coming. And we know the half has not even been told, God. I pray that you would help us bring us back safely in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. <laughs>